We have been looking forward to this meeting and just asking God to work in our midst. I trust you've been doing the very same thing. And what a pleasure to be here. What a pleasure to have sunshine. I talked to your pastor last week. We were in Arizona and he said it wasn't quite so sunshiny and nice here last weekend. And there was some plowing that needed to be done. And and so we've been praying that if we stayed in Arizona and Southern California long enough, it would get nice on this side of the country. And I'm, I'm pleased to announce to you that we brought the nice with us. Now, if it turns nasty next week, it's not our fault. But we brought the nice with us today. Thank you for being here this morning. I hope you'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And we'll have a wonderful time in the Word of God. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter number 27. There are CDs out there, and I think out that direction, in the hallway, there's music, there's preaching, there's all kinds of stuff. But there's some prayer cards out there. Uh, Please make your way through there and get one of those prayer cards and take it home and pray for us. But we need that. We really do. If there's one thing that you could do for us that would be of greatest help, it's just remember to pray for us from time to time, and we greatly appreciate that. So make sure you look at all this stuff, but, but take a prayer card and pray for us if you would. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God this morning? Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 27. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes, we would clear our minds of all of the events of the day and the things we have to do this afternoon and tomorrow. And think for just a few minutes about the cross that the choir sang about today. And focus on that event and that day. And see it again afresh this morning. And Lord, if there is one standing here today that has never trusted Christ as Savior, I pray that today would indeed be the day of salvation for them. Well, thank you and praise you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Look again at verse 36, if you would. Here's the horrible scene, and, and Jesus and the, and the two thieves are up on the crosses, and, and it's bloody, and it's gory, and it's, and it's a horrible, awful scene. And you get to verse 36. It says, and sitting down, they watched him there. That seems like an odd verse right in the middle that, that there were people there watching the whole thing. That's not the kind of thing that most of us today would want to have to watch, let alone just to go and watch. And yet there were people there who saw all of the events that occurred. And they all had different reactions, just like they would today. There were those who mocked the Savior. If you look back at verse number 29... It talks about those soldiers. It says, when they planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they made fun of him and, and they mocked him and mocked him and mocked him. He was not what they had expected. He was not what the Jews had expected when they thought of their coming Messiah and their coming King. He was not what these soldiers had expected. 
It's an amazing thing. You know, Jesus Christ came and, and revealed himself to his people and, and they rejected him. Why? Well, because they were looking for somebody to come and deliver them politically and economically and socially and set up a kingdom there in Jerusalem. And instead, Jesus came and he said, I can I can take care of your sin problem. They said, we don't want that taken care of. We want this other stuff taken care of. And so they mocked him. He was not what they expected. He was not what they wanted. You know, there are people like that today. They hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, the wonderful redemption and forgiveness of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And their, their response is, well, what about my job? And what about my this? And what about my that? And here's what I want and here's what I need. And Jesus says, here's what I offer. And they say, I don't want that. I, I want a big house and a nice car and a good family. And I want that stuff. And Jesus says, I'm offering redemption. And so they mock. They mock. And they make fun, and, and that's exactly what happened here. He was not what they wanted. He was not what they expected in John chapter 1, verse number 11. It says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He says, He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus came and took our sin upon us, and they weren't looking for that. It's not what they wanted. First Peter chapter number 2, verse 24 says, He bare our sins in His own body. On the tree. And instead people say, what can I get? What's, I, I want more stuff. I want things. I want, I want health and I want prosperity. And I want, I want all, all kinds of stuff. And Jesus says, I'll take your sin. They say, no, I'm not interested in that. They weren't interested in what Jesus came and what he offered. And so they mocked. Maybe there were some people there that had seen some miracles. And, and they expected him to do something spectacular. So they mocked him when nothing spectacular happened. There were those who mocked him. There were those who just watched. Those are the people in verse number 36. And sitting down, they watched him there. I can't imagine. Maybe there were, maybe there were some people there who came because of the two thieves that were crucified that day. They had maybe been the recipients of the wickedness of those men. And so they came and they wanted to see justice done. And, and maybe there were some who brought their children and no doubt said, look, this is what happens when you live that kind of a life. When you don't obey and when you don't do what you're supposed to, and when you don't act right. Listen, that's how you end up. And I don't ever want you to end up that way. No doubt there were some who did that. And there were others who just wanted to see justice done and just wanted to see them crucified. And there were some who just wanted to see Jesus. Can you imagine, maybe there were people sitting there in that place that day who had been on another hillside when Jesus took five loaves and two fishes and broke them apart and fed thousands and thousands of people. Maybe some of those same folks were sitting there that day watching Jesus just to see what he would do. Surely he wouldn't allow this to go on. Surely he would do something. And they just wanted to see what kind of miraculous event would occur. And so they just watched. Maybe there were some who had heard him teach, heard him preach, and they just wanted to see what was happening here on this day. Maybe, maybe there were some old men sitting there who years ago, 33 years ago, they had been young men and they were, they were on a hillside watching sheep one night. And all of a sudden the darkness split open and angels appeared in the sky and informed them that their Savior was born. And they ran down into town and they saw that little baby. I just wonder if maybe there weren't a couple old guys there that used to be shepherds who had seen him as a little baby. Listen, if I had been one of those shepherds to whom the angels announced that the Messiah had come, I would have kind of kept track of that baby through his life. I mean, if an angel told me that was the Messiah, I'd want to know what he was doing and where he was living and what was going on with him. And probably they had listened and they had watched and they had followed. And now they knew that that same one was hanging on a cross. And maybe a couple of those old guys were sitting there watching, thinking, what in the world has happened? What? How could it all end up this way? And they watched. They watched. Maybe there were some who were at that wedding. Where Jesus turned water into wine. Maybe there were some who had heard stories about him walking on water. Maybe there were some who had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. No doubt some of those folks were there. And they were watching to see 
what was going to happen. Maybe there were some who were just watching out of curiosity. You know, some folks do that today. They, they come to a place where, the, where the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, but they don't come because they're interested in Jesus. They come because they're just curious. You know, I know this is hard for you folks to believe, but there are some folks who don't come to church because they love God. There are some folks who come to see what somebody else is wearing. There are some who come to see what kind of new car somebody bought last week, and if it's out in the parking lot, whether or not it's dirty yet. I know that's hard to imagine. It's hard to comprehend. But there are folks that shallow. There really are. I know not here. Those are in other places. They're like Arizona, where we were last week. That's, that's not here in Cleveland. I know that. But there are some folks who just come to see the show. Did you know? I know you, this is so odd that you could never fathom this. But there are people who sit in church. And all that they do while they sit in church is take notes of mistakes. Really. The preacher says something not quite right. They write it down. He makes an announcement backwards. They write it down. Somebody forgets a word in a song. They write it down. And they go. They love the bulletin. Those folks love the bulletin. They live for bulletins. Because as soon as they get that bulletin, they sit down and they scour that bulletin. Looking for mistakes in that bulletin. It's a highlight of their Sunday. They can find a blooper in the bulletin. Really? Just, just curious. Just want to see what's going on. And they're just watching what happens. While amazing, powerful, miraculous things are happening right in their midst. They're just oblivious. They're just watching. Just watching the show. There are those who mocked and there were those who watched. But whether or not they believed who he was or, or rejected him, the amazing thing is we read verse 37 where they put over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Whether they believed it or not, they had to see that. Isn't that something? And as a matter of fact, they said, don't put that up there, take it down. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written, and it stays. And whether they loved him or hated him, every time they looked up there, they saw that sign. It said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Literally, it just said, you are killing your Messiah. And every time they looked up there, even if they hated him, they had to look at that sign. And every time they saw it, they were confronted with the truth of what was going on that day on that cross. There were those who mocked and those who watched. And there were those who feared. Look at chapter 27, verse number 51. There were those who feared it. It says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Look at verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were those who saw what was happening that day. And instead of mocking or just watching, their reaction was that they were afraid. They were afraid. And that centurion looked up there and he said to himself, let me, let me put this in plain old ordinary modern day English, okay? Oops. We blew it this time. We've crucified an awful lot of people up there. And it's the first time it's ever happened this way. Somebody came running from town and said, something happened. The temple's in a mess and the, and the veil's ripped apart. That's not supposed to happen. And then the earth began to shake and, and it got dark. And that centurion said, we are in trouble. He must have been who he said he was. And he was afraid. And rightfully so. Maybe that centurion was one who held a hammer in his hand and drove nails through the hands of our precious Savior. Maybe that centurion was the one who gave the order to pound that crown of thorns in his head. Maybe that centurion was the one who jammed a spear into his side. But that centurion suddenly realized there was more to what was going on this day than he had ever seen before in a crucifixion. And it was not normal. And something unusual was happening right in front of his eyes. And suddenly it dawned on him that the sign above the head of Jesus Christ was indeed true. And he had just had a hand in killing the Son of God. Can you imagine? But let me tell you this morning, it wasn't a centurion that took the life of Jesus Christ. 
It wasn't some soldier. It wasn't some Roman court. It wasn't the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and those that conspired against Him. Let me tell you what it was that took the life of Jesus Christ. It was you. It was as much you as it was the centurion that drove those nails. It was as much you as it was the ones that hauled Him up that hill. It was as much you as the ones that whipped Him with that whip. It was you. It was your sin. And it was my sin. It wasn't some soldier. It was your sin and my sin that put him on that cross. That's what, that's what caused the Lord Jesus Christ to give his life. Not some soldier, not some army, not some conspiracy, but your sin and my sin and the sins of the whole world. The truth is, we were guilty. John chapter 3, verse number 16. You know it, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But do you know what it says after that? It says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So I, I've never, I've never done anything bad to Jesus and I've never even just walked away from Him. I've never rejected Him. I, you know, I've not been a religious person or a church person, but I've never, I've never said I don't like Jesus. Listen, you're condemned already. You don't have to shake your fist in the face of God and blaspheme Jesus in order to be condemned. All you have to do is not trust Him as your Savior and you are condemned already because it was your sin that put Him on that cross. You're already condemned. What a terrible, terrible condition. Listen, maybe you're here today and you came because you're afraid. There are folks who come to church because they're afraid. They have trouble sleeping at night. They get afraid when they think about what's going to happen to them one day when they die. And you will die one day. You may say, well, I have, I have a lot of years left. The truth is you don't have a clue how many years you have left. You may not have a week left. And you will die one day. And you will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. And that bothers you when you think about it. And when you go to sleep at night, you worry that you might die in your sleep. And you'd wake up in the fires of hell. And you're afraid, and rightfully so, because you're under the condemnation of Almighty God. You're condemned already. The centurion was afraid because he'd had a hand in the death of the Savior. There are folks who come to church for the very same reason. They're afraid. And sometimes they come because they want to be made to feel a little better. They want to try harder and do better and be a good person so that they don't worry about those kind of things. Can I tell you, that's not how you get rid of that fear. That's not how you get rid of that fear. It's not enough just to know that Jesus died on a cross and that you are in part responsible for that death. That is not enough if you stop there. But there are more folks here. There are some who came looking for Jesus. Look at chapter 28. The crucifixion is over. The body is put in a tomb. Chapter, chapter number 28. There were those who came seeking Jesus. Verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Thank God. There were people there that watched. There were people that mocked. There were people there just interested in the, in the curiosity factor of what was going on. But there were a couple ladies who came seeking for Jesus. They came to look for him. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 12, says, And ye shall seek me and find me, in verse 13, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You see, the good news is this. If you're looking for Jesus today, you don't have to look far. You don't have to look far. Because the truth is, he's already looking for you. Let's look down here a little further. We stopped in verse 5. Look at verse 6, chapter 28. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Look at verse number 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. 
Here they are. The angels told them that Jesus is risen. And they're running off to tell the disciples. And as they went, Jesus met them. Isn't that interesting? They didn't have to look very far because he was right there just waiting for them. That's all. You know, a lot of folks are looking for Jesus today. A lot of folks are looking for Jesus in the wrong places. They are. They think that Jesus is in some kind of cosmic hide-and-seek game with them. And they gotta, they got to dig through all kinds of stuff to find him. Some think he's hiding in the bottom of a baptismal pool. Some think he's hiding in a church someplace. Some think he's hiding in a religious system or, or, or under a pile of good works or a bag of money. And they think if they go through all that, they just might find Jesus. Nobody's ever found Jesus in those places. It's not where you find Jesus. Do you ever play hide and seek? How many of you ever played hide and seek? Okay, it's been a while for some of you, hasn't it? It's been a little while. It's not something you do once you get past 40. Well, no, that's when you, you start playing it again, don't you? When you get past 40, because then there are grandchildren or, or children, in our case, children. And they like to play hide and seek. I remember as a kid, I, ha- I had an aunt and uncle that lived across the road from us. And there were other neighbors lived across the road this way. And, and they all had kids. And there were a whole bunch of us kids in the, in the neighborhood. We rode our bikes and we played and just constantly outside playing together. The whole mess of us. There, I guess there were probably eight or nine of us all together. We just played all the time. I was, I was one of the youngest of the bunch. And we would play hide and seek. And you know how it works. Somebody, somebody counts and everybody runs and they hide and, and then it's time and they start finding people. You find the best hiding place you can find. And you, you're really, really quiet and, and you hear other people being found. And they squeal with delight. You know, somebody's found and they're screaming and laughing and all kinds of stuff. And then you start to get the distinct impression that everybody might have been found. And they might not be looking for you. That it ever happened to you? That, that happened to me a couple of times. Being the youngest one, you know, they weren't that concerned if they didn't find me. And, and there I'd be stuck. And, and if they couldn't find you, pretty soon you start revealing yourself, you know. Start knocking on the tree or poking your head around or <coughs> coughing. Just trying to get somebody to come look for you. And you want to be found. You know, that's how Jesus is. He's not hiding. He's not hiding. He wants to be found. He really does. He said, he said, if you seek me, you will find me. What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful truth. In Jeremiah 29, 14, he said, I will be found of you. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not whosoever shall join the church and get baptized in the tank and give money and do good works. That's not what he said. He's, if, he, if Jesus were here physically this morning, he'd be standing right here saying, here I am. Here I am. You don't have to jump through religious hoops and you don't have to hunt to find me. Here I am. Just come find me. There were those who sought Jesus. The wonderful truth is, if you're seeking Jesus, you can find him. You can find him. You know what another wonderful truth is? You don't even have to be seeking him. And you can find him. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure why you're here today. Maybe you came for breakfast. Yeah, really, honestly. If I hadn't had to drive so far yesterday, I'd have come for breakfast. I would have. I'm all for free food. Amen. I'm all about free food. Yeah, it's good stuff. Maybe you just came for breakfast and out of guilt you stayed for church because it wouldn't look spiritual if you went home after breakfast. (laughs) And so here you are this morning putting in your religious time. God bless you. That's wonderful. I'm so glad. The good news is, even if all you did is come for breakfast, you can find Jesus today. Because he's standing there saying, here I am. Here I am. Maybe you came to mock. Oh, nobody would be here like that. Oh, usually there are some. He came to just make fun, you know, about these old-fashioned fuddy-duddies, you know. The good news is, even if you came just to mock, you could find Jesus today. Because he's standing here saying, I'll be found of you. I'll be found. Maybe you came today just to watch the show. You knew something was going on today. I mean, there was free food. Somebody was going to sing. Somebody was going to preach. Maybe there'd be tap dancing. Who knows? I noticed you got this nice wooden platform. No, no. Only on Monday nights. 
Only on Monday nights if the pastor's not here. That's the only way that would ever happen. <laughs> but you just came just to, just to see the show and see what would happen. You didn't, you didn't know much of what was going on. You didn't care much of what was going on. You just thought, here's a way to spend an hour or two. And away we go. Good news is, it doesn't matter. You could find Jesus today. Because he's here ready to be found by you. Or maybe you came today because you're afraid. You know that if you were to die today, it would not be good. You don't know for sure that if you left this earth this morning, you would spend eternity in heaven. You may not be sure where you'd go, but you're pretty nervous about it. The good news is, you can find Jesus today. And it'll answer that question forever. Forever. Or maybe today you came because you are indeed seeking the Savior. You're curious about Jesus. You wanted to know a little bit about him. You just wanted to see. You just wanted to see what people who know Jesus are like. Well, you found him. And today you can find him. He's wanting to be found by you. It doesn't matter why you came. It doesn't matter your motive. It doesn't matter your purpose. All that matters is that Jesus is here, ready to be found by you. And if you would come today and put your faith and trust in Him as your personal Savior, you could walk out of here. You could walk out of here a redeemed, born-again child of God. You know what he said in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 20? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, you don't have to go find him. He's trying to get you to let him in. He wants to be found. He wants to be found. The wonderful news of the gospel is that you can have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Today. Today. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. As those people sat there and looked at that cross... They saw Jesus and they saw the sign and they saw the two thieves. They saw the earthquake and the darkness and heard about the temple and, and they knew that indeed that was Him. And they came to a point where they had to make a decision. Do I believe that that's the Son of God or do I reject the Son of God? And you have to come to that same place of decision today. You can't walk out of here today saying, well, He was a good teacher. That's not an option, because he claimed to be the Son of God. And a good teacher wouldn't claim that unless it were true. So he was either a liar, or he was indeed the Son of God. Today, oh, you've come and you've seen him up there. Will you leave the same way that you came? Or will you leave having trusted him as your personal Savior today? Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father.